A warm welcome to all of you who have joined us today for this important seminar of emerging security sector leaders in Africa under the theme leadership in times of uncertainty. My name is Luca Byung Deng Kual. I am the Dean of Academic Affairs at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies and the faculty lead of this program on emerging security sector leaders in Africa. This session uh, is, is the last session of our seminar on emerging security leaders. And this, this session is about leveraging partnerships in responding to unexpected security challenges and crisis. Before is starting our conversation with the panelists on, on leveraging part, partnership in responding to unexpected security challenges and crisis. Let me share with you the key takeaways from the previous session, session three. The main objective of that session was to examine how security leaders and institutions respond to unexpected security challenges and crisis and to assess the role of the national security strategy in confronting such challenges and crises. One key takeaway from the discussion, whether in the plenary or in the discussion group, is that national security strategy is a critical tool for adaptive leadership. If the process of developing and implementing national security is inclusive, participatory, and people-centered, the national security, as argued very well by Dr. Fairley, will meet the five principles that guide adaptive leadership. Indeed, national security strategy could become a critical tool for adaptive leadership. These are some of the key takeaways. One of the principles of the adaptive leadership is ensure evidence-based learning and adaptation. The national security strategy development process is start fundamentally with a thorough audit of security sector, evidence-driven assessment of security threats and opportunities, and adapting national security to become a living document through a monitoring mechanism that is built on a learning in iterative way. The second principle that is linked to the national security strategy is stress testing underlying theories, assumptions, and beliefs. The process of the national security strategy development is about a theory of change and stress testing of the traditional way that security has been perceived, planned, or even articulated, managed and delivered and overseen. The other principle of the adaptive leadership is streamlining deliberative decision-making. The inclusive process of the national security strategy development provides opportunity to transform policy-making process from a siloed response process to, to security challenges to a more open, dynamic, noble, collective, and structured policy making and implementation process. The, the fourth um, uh, principle is a strengthening transparency, in, inclusion, and accountability. The inclusive, open, honest, and participatory design of national security strategy as a policy, as a public policy, will bring it, will bring the much needed transparency and accountability in security sector by recognizing mistakes as an opportunity for shared learning. And the last principle is about mobilize collective action with shared national security vision, shared and aligned security objectives collective assessment of security threats, clear division of labor, 
and clear mechanism for coordination and decision-making process. National security strategy become, can create a solid foundation for nurturing collective action. But the last takeaway is implementation of such a strategy. There are many good public policies that are rarely implemented, not only in Africa, but even globally. Some of the key elements for a successful response to unexpected security challenges besides having a national security strategy include a resilient citizen, investing in a resilient citizen. The best preparation for confronting unexpected security challenges and crisis, as well argued by General Diop, is the investment in citizens to become resilient to these challenges. The second element, human resource development. Beside the resilient citizen, resilient citizen, having a trained professional and motivated human resource is the best way to respond to these unexpected security challenges as manifested in the case of the COVID-19. Third is about the resources. The efficient use of resources, whether it's financial or human resource or partnership as part of the resource envelope and realignment of resources guided by strategic objectives are critical for effective response to unexpected security challenges. The fourth, accountability. Having transparent and open decision-making process is critical in response to unexpected challenges. The COVID-19 has shown that leaders who are transparent, open, with inclusive policy-making process are more likely to succeed in confronting the crisis and gaining the trust of the citizens. The last but not least, communication. Linked to accountability is communication. Uh, leaders who communicated, communicate very well and effective during the crisis tend to succeed in mobilizing national collective action in confronting unexpected security challenges and crisis and winning the trust of the citizen as, as well during the, the crisis. So these are really the key takeaways. And this one, this session is about levering partnership and partnership is part of the resource envelope uh, in responding to any crisis. But let me introduce uh, uh, Kate. Uh, who is going to moderate this session? Ms. Kate Knopf, the director of the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, she will be introducing the objective of this session, the panelists, and she will equally be moderating the session. But just some of the highlights, and you have that her bios. Kate has served as the director of the Africa Center since 2014. Before joining the Africa Center, uh, Kate has spent most of her career focusing on the intersection of security and development in Africa. She held several senior positions at the U.S. Agency for International Development, USID, including Assistant Administrator for Africa. Ms. Kate holds, uh, Ms. Knopf uh, holds uh, Master of uh, Master of Arts and Bachelor of Arts from John Hopkins University. So, Kate, you are welcome. Well, thank you, Dr. Luca, and uh, thanks uh, for uh, giving us the key takeaways uh, and reminding us of uh, the progression that we're on over the course of these weeks as we consider adaptive leadership in times of uncertainty. Um, we're really pleased uh, today to turn our attention now to uh, how uh, we as leaders can uh, leverage partnerships uh, to respond uh, to unexpected security challenges. Uh, and uh, in particular, we want to focus on 
um, the importance of partnership, of collective action, uh, and mobilizing and coordinating responses. Uh, sometimes this could be with external partners to the uh, continent. Uh, sometimes this is uh, uh, partners within uh, the continent uh, uh, at various levels of national, regional, and continental uh, levels, uh, and uh, sometimes with our international institutions. Now, so we're going to uh, consider today some of the lessons uh, from uh, situations like Ebola and COVID-19, uh, as well as more traditional security challenges, you know, such as the exponential rise uh, that we're seeing, sadly, in some parts of the continent uh, with you know, violent extremism. You know, we're seeing you know, the growth of transnational organized crime in many places. Uh, and of course, as we discussed, especially in, in our week two session, uh, we have structural uh, 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 changes such as climate change that uh, are impacting our security landscape in quite considerable ways. And so how do leaders leverage partnership and improve coordination to respond to these kinds of challenges and uh, so many more that you've been talking about uh, in your discussion groups uh, over these weeks. And so how can, uh, uh, how can we understand why some countries and some regions have been more successful in leveraging partnerships uh, and uh, even external assistance uh, to, to mitigate these challenges and, uh, and uh, how you know, can we learn you know, uh, from adaptation you know, and applying some of the lessons we thought about last week with national security strategy you know, development and prioritization to inform uh, our approach to partnerships. Uh, so to help us with our topic today, we have a very distinguished panel I'm delighted to introduce. Uh, we'll be joined by uh, Ambassador Fatima Kiari Mohammed, uh, who is uh, the permanent observer of the African Union to the United Nations. Uh, and in addition to her representational functions, her mandate includes developing and maintaining constructive and productive institutional relationships between the African Union and United Nations institutions. Uh, uh, she also supports and coordinates the activities of the African group at the United Nations as well as ensuring the effective monitoring, implementation, and promotion of African Union decisions within the African group in multilateral institutions. Prior to her appointment, she was a senior advisor to the ECOWAS uh, Commission, and uh, she has a career that spans more than two decades with a focus on peace, security, socioeconomic development, regional integration, organizational development, project management uh, in both public and private sectors. Uh, you know, she's studied peace and security, uh, development and conflict transformation uh, at a range of institutions you know, from the University of Innsbruck, the United Nations University for Peace, uh, and the European University uh, in Switzerland. Uh, and we're most uh, uh, proud that uh, Ambassador Mohammed is uh, an alumna of uh, the Africa Center, uh, having uh, participated in our Cedar Leaders Seminar uh, previously. And uh, uh, she will be joined by Ambassador Phil Carter, uh, who is a dear friend of the Africa Center. Uh, he is president of the Mead Hill Group, which is an international executive advisory service. Uh, and prior to that, he had a very long and distinguished career uh, in, uh, as an American diplomat uh, in our foreign service uh, in the United States. Uh, he served um, as the civilian deputy to the commander of Africa Command. Uh, so the deputy for civil military engagements. Uh, he also uh, served as uh, the U.S. ambassador to the Ivory Coast, uh, to Gabon. Uh, he served as the deputy chief of mission in Madagascar and Gabon. Uh, sorry, and uh, I, I've got the second country wrong. Guinea. Sorry, Phil. Uh, ambassador in Gabon, deputy chief of mission in Guinea. Uh, he was the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, of the Africa Bureau. He served as the Acting Assistant Secretary of the Africa Bureau and on and on and on. Uh, and so he brings to us a wealth of experience uh, navigating uh, partnerships uh, with African uh, countries uh, and uh, lessons uh, learned uh, from uh, his time in service, uh, both uh, uh, from the State Department perspective and with the bird's eye view of, of uh, US Africa Command. So thank you, Phil, for joining us today. So we're gonna start, uh, I think, with Ambassador Carter uh, and Ambassador Mohammed uh, will join us uh, momentarily. Uh, she's uh, 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 busy doing her job uh, and uh, we're really uh, delighted that uh, uh, to have a chance to, to, to talk with her uh, in a few moments. Um, but uh, Phil, um, 
Uh, we've spent a lot of time uh, talking uh, in various uh, fora and setting uh, about how to make external uh, security assistance more effective, right, in supporting African countries to uh, respond to complex security challenges. And over the course of this program, we've been talking about you know, the kinds of challenges that are foreseeable, as well as those that um, are completely unexpected uh, and uh, maybe don't even initially appear as a security challenge like the COVID-19 pandemic, but of course have security implications uh, 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 as uh, uh, it affects every part of society. And so, um, uh, from your perspective and uh, your experience, um, what what makes uh, external uh, security assistance uh, um, more effective, uh, more useful uh, for African partners uh, in responding to this, you know, vast range of uh, challenges that uh, sometimes they're confronted with uh, uh, too many of these uh, at once, uh, uh, but even one of them can can seem a bit overwhelming. Uh, and um, uh, what are the main kinds of challenges that you've observed? Uh, African you know, governments and you know, external partners like the United States you know, face in trying to work together to meet you know, challenges such as these. Well, Kate, thank you. Uh, good, hello to everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, <laughs> wherever you may be. And Kate, thank you for that very simple question. Um, <laughs> um, I'm, I think personally, what I think is I find there's a direct relationship or a correlation <laughs> Uh, between how prepared a government, an African government is and the effectiveness of the in external security assistance it receives. Now, you know, you know, what do I mean by that? I mean, I mean, it's like a government that has a clearly articulated and, and defined plan or strategy uh, to deal with a security challenge is better at marshalling uh, the assistance it needs compared to those governments that lack such a plan or strategy. Um, you know, without a strategy, assistance will be defined by the donor and not by uh, the uh, African government as a recipient. And I also think that it just the saying you have a strategy isn't enough. I mean, the, it's the quality of that strategy. It's the way it, it's structured and the better the strategy. And by this, I mean, the more forward looking it is or the more anticipatory it is, um, uh, the better it will be the, its quality and, the, and, and its ability to, to, to marshal the appropriate type of external assistance that, that a government may require. Um, you know, there's always a lag between what one asks for and when you receive it. I mean, there's, you know, each government, each donor has procurement challenges. Uh, the United States is incredible, it takes an incredible amount of time for us to, to get material, uh, to, uh, training programs on the board for uh, any kind of uh, security partner. And the more complex the requirement, the longer the lag time. I mean, um, I recall a couple of cases when I was at AFRICOM where uh, we had a request from one government for um, um, helicopters. And it took us two and a half years to get the helicopters to the government uh, with the training package. And in that two and a half years, the security environment in that country changed considerably. So were those helicopters appropriate for the time that they were received? Um, we would like to think so, but really, you know, it's one of these things where the government has to anticipate its needs and the challenges it faces over the horizon, over the next few years, to make sure that the assistance will be effective. Um, so you have to keep that in mind, that the provision of security assistance can take several months, if not years. So by definition, a strategy has to be forward-looking to be effective. Um, and, uh, you know, you have to think about those new requirements. Now, when I look back over the past few decades, and unfortunately, I can say that personally, that I can look back at previous decades, um, I say that security assistance is uh, contribution um, to the improvement of overall security in Africa has not been that effective, to be perfectly candid with you. I mean, it could be better. I mean, I'm not saying it was, wasn't worthless, but it could have been better. Um, you know, there's a lot of assistance that was, was a waste of materiel and training and resources. Uh, there was a lack of sustainability. And what you find is with a good strategy and plan, that issue of sustainability, how are you going to utilize the assistance you receive for the immediate challenge that you face and for future challenges that you anticipate are blended together. And that's very, very critical. Um, and you look at the ongoing uh, crisis in the Sahel. I mean, it's received tremendous amount of assistance and even direct military support, yet that threat 
of violent extremism is actually worse today than it was 10 years ago. Uh, you would, would you say that assistance is effective in that context? Would you say that the strategies that are being used are effective in that context? Or are they just continuing to do the same thing they received in the past? And to me, when you're focusing on the status quo, when you're not focusing on, on looking at innovative ways to deal with a challenge when, when there has been failure in the past, you're in a, you have a problem. And you know, the assistance you receive will not be solving your problem or helping you solve your problem because in the end, assistance does not solve the problem. It helps facilitate a solution generated by the African governments themselves. And uh, so I think we have to look at that as a, as a, as a hard example of what's going on now. Um, and I don't think things will improve. Uh, I think uh, the new competition between the West and China and Russia and Africa raises echoes of a new sort of Cold War uh, uh, security assistance scene. You know, this is a, what we saw back in the day of the Soviet Union. Um, you know, I read recently, I think from the ACSS uh, analysis that Russia and China are now some of the largest providers of arms to Africa respectively. Um, and, you know, just the provision of arms does not mean that security assistance is obtained, you know, or, or that security is obtained. It just doesn't work that way. Um, but, you know, both, both are getting more involved in peacekeeping, but their engagements don't necessarily uh, correspond to the constructs of the United Nations or the African Union. You know, they're there using peacekeeping perhaps as a foil to test new weapon systems or to expand their, um, their influence. Um, you know, the circumstances on the ground are just a means by which they can achieve their um, foreign policy objectives. And that's something that one has to take into account. And I believe that the elements of international secu security in Africa are becoming more complex with each passing year. It's just getting, more, you mentioned climate change, transnational crime, you know, these are all things that are happening. We look at the peacekeeping operation in Mali, and I can't think of a more complex peacekeeping situation, more dangerous peacekeeping situation than what is happening right now in Mali for the United Nations and all the troop contributing countries that are there. Um, so, but the need for peacekeeping, effective peacekeeping uh, will not go away. The threat of terrorism will persist and the return of great power competition coupled with these transnational or global challenges, you know, are gonna make, um, it, you know, like climate change, trafficking, pandemics now, you know, have to deal with a new space race and the acceler and accelerating technological change are gonna make the, the space for security assistance even more challenging. And in that way, uh, governments need to be um, uh, more studied. I mean, Luca was talking about all the things you need. You need better human resources. You need better planning. You need greater transparency. All of these elements are what are necessary for when a government uh, approaches its donor partners and asks for assistance, you know, you're not going to get anything if you don't ask for it. But that ask had better be informed. It had better be anticipatory. It had better be well articulated. And I think those are some of the key elements of adaptive leadership. And we can come back to that later if you want. Well, um, yes, we definitely want to do that. Um, I want to um, uh, probe a little bit further uh, on what kinds of security assistance um, uh, you think um, lends itself best uh, for external partners uh, to, to come in and support with. You've mentioned some examples of, um, you know, very tangible things like helicopters, um, so equipment. Um, um, but uh, there's other sorts of uh, assistance, right, in terms of uh, institutional development, organizational development. Um, uh, uh, and so uh, uh, maybe give us a, a thought or two from your experience of where, where you've seen most effective uh, external actors, whether the United States or other partners, come alongside uh, of a security sector you know, and, uh, you know, and what forms have that assistance taken and or how, how should we be thinking a little bit more creatively you know, about um, external partnerships and yeah. assistance in that. That's a good case. question. I think, I think we could take a page out of what um, the United States has done with regard to peacekeeping training. I mean, you know, uh, virtually almost every single peacekeeper in, in Africa has been trained to some degree or another by the United States to some fashion. And we look at this, if you look at the state of African peacekeeping capabilities 15 years ago, maybe a little longer, and you look at where it is now, it is incredibly uh, improved. 
I mean, it is, it is far more, the Africans are far more capable and they're, they are contributing. They are worldwide. They are not only looking at peacekeeping operations in Africa, they are, they are making major contributions to the whole uh, the world through the UN system. And uh, those capabilities were there, but look at that training. It was focusing on, uh, you know, what could be resilient training. It wasn't, you know, the equipment, the material, you know, the APCs, the weapons, those were the last things that arrived. You know, what it's, it's that environment shaping type of training that is absolutely critical. So for, for example, um, you want to receive assistance. You want to make sure your, your military is effective in the projection of its forces so that it can address a security challenge, either nationally or regionally or internationally. But if 90 per, over 90% of your military budget is just going to salaries, you have no scope whatsoever for effective training or sustainability or maintenance of the equipment that you have or will receive. So, I mean, I think what has to happen first is that the institutional side of things needs to be looked at. You need to have a defense ministry that is able to manage um, the resources it has effectively, transparently, so that people know, so the citizens and the leadership know how that money is being utilized. You need to have, um, uh, you need to have a military that has a, a, uh, an actual, or, and security forces that have an actual uh, system of human resource management and development. I mean, one of the challenges we see in Africa is that um, it's very top heavy with uh, mid-level officers who've been in those positions for decades. I mean, you have captains who've been captains for decades. Uh, you know, that is not a good thing. Um, I also think that um, African militaries need to look at strengthening their non-commissioned officer corps a bit better uh, so that because in our system, those are the folks that do the heavy lifting in terms of managing the troops, as well as being able to coordinate the planning that's being done by the officer corps and by the civilian leadership. So I think, you know, that kind of human resource training is, is critically important, uh, that some of the technical training uh, in terms, and I talk about technical training, I'm talking about budgeting, <laughs> I'm talking about, you know, human resource management, I'm not necessarily talking about how to maintain a tank. That comes later. But if you're gonna have someone who's gonna be trained on a tank, they have to be fed, they have to be uniformed, they have to know where they are in their training program, they have to know what their career is gonna look like. And those who are leaving the system need to be able to have an effective retirement so that you have a strong career in a military or security service. So I think that's fundamental. I can tell you a couple of instances where um, I've had to deal with requests for materiel or equipment that, you know, really it, 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 it didn't generate the kind of confidence that we needed. I mean, I had one situation where um, uh, a head of a military was asking for equipment that did not exist. It hadn't been invented yet. It was fictional stuff. And when you get something like that, you're kind of like scratching your head saying, well, do we really, I think we need to look at something more fundamental here. Uh, so that, that is something that you have to look at. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that a government that only focuses on the strict definition of security, you know, a military, the police, but not the broader issue of security, looking at other stakeholders, um, the plan, the strategy, the requests tend to be more narrow, they tend to be less resilient, they tend to be less anticipatory. And so I think, you know, you know the competition for, for, for external assistance is very stiff. And it's going to get harder to get good assistance from other folks because there's such the competing demands. And so the better your strategy is, the more integrated that strategy or plan that you have is integrated into the broader construct of development of a country, um, of its social parameters, that there's more stakeholders involved. You know, I'm gonna be perfectly candid with you. When we were at AFRICOM and when I was an ambassador and working at State Department, when we would get requests and we would see that these requests were only designed within the Ministry of Defense and there hadn't been some kind of cross-cutting intersectoral dialogue about what was necessary to address the security challenge, we were skeptical of its effectiveness. Whereas those governments who said, you know, we brought, a, we brought a, a working group together that represented stakeholders, you know, 
NGOs, youth groups, women's groups, and we looked at this problem and we think, you know, with a combination of development assistance and security assistance, we might be able to address this in a sustainable, resilient way. That country would get assistance quickly. Uh, those that didn't, did not. So. <clears throat> That's um, uh, very uh, helpful uh, in uh, taking us uh, to the, uh, the question about how do we better um, harmonize, right, uh, between external actors and uh, the priorities of, you know, whether it's the United States or uh, you've mentioned Russia, China, uh, there are other partners mm -hmm. on the continent too, of course. Uh, we all come uh, from our uh, starting points as, uh, as nations and uh, what's of interest to us. You know, we all have our own analysis of what's happening on the continent, but um, what really matters, uh, what I hear you saying, is whether the country itself has done its analysis, has set its priorities, has articulated uh, that in a way, and ideally done that working uh, across ministries and uh, across related sectors that, that impact on each other. And, uh, you know, is that, is, that, is that something, Phil, that only... Um, only uh, countries that are in stable security situations that uh, have their act together, so to speak, that have you know, uh, well-run ministries, uh, can, can, is that only something that they can achieve? Or you know, how, how can you know, colleagues who you know, maybe are sitting in, in countries that are very challenged by array of uh, uh, issues uh, that um, are still struggling you know, to, to get the human resources and uh, the, the pieces of their institutions uh, all working in the same direction. How do they arrive at, at priorities? That's a good question. Relate to well, arriving at those priorities requires a broad dialogue nationally, right? I mean, you need, you can't, you know, one ministry um, can't resolve all security issues, right? So you need to have as many people at the table uh, discussing the issue, examining the issue, and doing it honestly. You know, showing not just, you know, look, being asset, uh, looking at the assets that a country has to put to the problem, but also looking at the gaps and, and recognizing its shortcomings. So if a country has like, you know, like three security challenges and they only have the resources for one of them, then acknowledging that there's those shortfalls and how would they manage those additional resources for those other security challenges with what they already have? The other thing to look at is sometimes, you know, if you if you have the same problem coming up decade after decade and you're using the same solution, you must recognize that that solution is ineffective. And so you may be stepping back and looking at it. Now, some countries don't even have the resources to be able to do that, but that in and of itself is an ask for assistance. You know, I mean, a government that says, you know, we need to do a better job of planning. We are not anticipatory enough. Show us how to do that. Donors can fill, the, fill that gap. They can help them develop the, the intellectual property necessarily, the capabilities mm -hmm. to do that kind of analysis. Thing is, remember, donors are talking to each other. Donors are not, you know, you know they, they get together and have sessions about what's going on if it's a regional crisis. They're going to see what they can do because they have to be accountable to their own taxpayers and they have to see what they can do. But I also think that donors need to listen to each other better so that they're not competing with each other as they should. And more importantly, they need to listen to their African partners more closely. And by that, I mean broadly. You know, not if, if they're only talking to the Ministry of Defense or the Ministry of Interior or some security advisor in the presidency, and they're not talking to the other stakeholders who are directly affected by the security challenge, then you're not getting an accurate picture of what, what is going on there. And, you can, and so that you can evaluate what's happening. The other thing is when you're being anticipatory, you have to struggle against institutional bias. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, when I was at AFRICOM, you know, we got an initial report of an Ebola incident in uh, Sierra Leone and Guinea. Now this was in December of yeah, I think 2012, I can't remember the year exactly, but it was in December. And at AFRICOM, we started asking um, the, wait a minute, whoa, slow down. You know, Ebola is not endemic in West Africa. It's never been there. We've, heard, we've seen it in Central Africa. We've seen it in mm -hmm. East Africa, but never in West. What do you think about that? Do you, is there any support that is necessary? I saw this as a looming problem. Um, and the institutional bias of the, of, of the international health organizations using models of Ebola that they developed in Central Africa said, no, no, everything is fine. It's contained, you know, we're understanding it. And we kept asking this question 
until such time as eight months later, we were asked urgently to come in because the, the, the disease had, had spread and we needed to, the US military had to intervene to provide that space so that the international health community could reset itself and, and provide training necessary to curb that disaster. There were strong lessons out of that experience you know, you, sometimes you learn more from your failures than your successes. And we learned a lot in that event that I think is helped, that helped um, set the stage as well as some of the other kind of vaccination programs we did like polio that helped set the stage to, to be better responding to a degree with COVID. Now COVID has other challenges and uh, mm -hmm. I think there's, there's some issues that need to be resolved, particularly among the G7, but I think that is uh, what needs to happen. Um, you know, everybody has a crisis. There's crises and there's a serial crisis, right? And if the other thing is you can't focus on the crisis of today and talk about external assistance because external assistance will come tomorrow. And so you need to think about what's happening tomorrow, what's going on over the horizon. And I think that is uh, uh, an important issue. And also recognizing that you might need more than just military or security tactics to address the security challenge. You know, when you're looking at the drivers of violence, let's say in the Sahel, much of the solutions are not in, the, there is no military solution to that. You're gonna to have to look at things like good governance, improving governance. You're gonna to have to look at providing the kind of um, administrative governmental support through education, health, uh, looking at opportunities for the youth. Those are, none of those issues are in the military. This is why an integrated strategy is critical. Um, and, and donors are there to help develop those strategies, help those countries develop the capacity to develop their strategies. And finally, um, you know, the decisions for assistance need to come from African capitals, not necessarily from donor capitals. And that can only happen when African governments are communicating with each other and with their own citizens. And I, I find that that is not happening as effectively as it could. So I think um, you've uh, actually uh, touched on uh, you know, each of the key attributes we've been talking about in adaptive oh. leadership in various ways, uh, uh, anticipation, uh, articulation, uh, identifying and uh, 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 naming uh, the, the challenge, uh, in, especially in an integrated uh, fashion adaptation, learning from our mistakes uh, and uh, failures. Uh, uh, and uh, sometimes things are just hard. And uh, we, we uh, none of us, uh, none of our countries, none of our governments get it uh, uh, exactly right uh, the first time we see a, a certain kind of challenge. Uh, and, and lastly, accountability you know, as, uh, as uh, leaders uh, to, our, um, uh, to our institutions, to our, our staff that uh, you know, uh, are working with us, but uh, most importantly to our citizens, you know, right? And to delivering results uh, uh, in terms of the security they need. So, and we'll come back and pick up on uh, more leadership lessons uh, uh, in a few moments, uh, uh, but uh, let's turn now to Ambassador Mohammed. Uh, uh, thank you uh, for joining us uh, and um, uh, bringing us, I think, some perspective from a, a, a multilateral uh, vantage point, uh, 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 most particularly. Um, and so, Ambassador Mohammed, uh, first of all, we would just welcome to, to have your perspective on when you look over the horizon uh, for, for the continent, uh, uh, the kinds of challenges that you think um, both regional and, and continental institutions um, uh, uh, could uh, uh, usefully uh, be most uh, seized with or, or what you see as most pressing uh, right now from, from where you're sitting, looking out five to 10 years. Um, uh, what, what, is, what is on your, what is weighing on you uh, when you think about that landscape? Over to you. Thank you. Thank you um, so much, Kate. And it's really um, a pleasure uh, for me to be uh, here with you uh, this morning. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to be able to share um, some thoughts uh, with you, uh, um, because this is a very important, uh, I think, um, uh, platform, but also um, uh, broadly speaking, the issue of security um, is, is, is important for the African Union. And uh, of course, uh, there's an, I think increasing recognition, um, not only by our member states, but also uh, globally uh, for the need of uh, the centrality of finding um, lasting solutions uh, 
to peace and security um, on the continent. Um, it's also a pleasure, of course, for me to share this uh, session with Ambassador Carter, and it was uh, very interesting to hear some of um, your thoughts uh, and, and, and perspectives uh, uh, this morning. Um, and also an honor for me to um, just be here with all the participants. You know, I had a look at uh, the, um, uh, the very impressive uh, list uh, that you have, uh, and um, I hope I will also be able to learn um, in the um, exchange uh, session. Um, so to go directly um, to your question, uh, Kate, um, um, I would probably start from maybe the perspective about, uh, from the perspective of, you know, the opportunities of for overcoming some of our security um, challenges in the last, um, last decade, because I think if we put it this way, you know, we already know uh, for the most part um, what the challenges are. And I think the challenges uh, remain uh, the same. Uh, you've mentioned terrorism, the issues of um, climate change, um, pandemics. Um, and uh, I would like to also add the issue of, of, of poverty, which is a pandemic in itself. Um, and I think uh, uh, a lot of uh, these challenges uh, will remain and will either be exacerbated uh, or, or, or mitigated um, uh, or resolved depending on uh, how, we, uh, how we manage them. In terms of terrorism, um, I think uh, we can all agree that this continues to be um, the most serious threat to international peace and uh, security. And this is true not only for the African continent, um, but the entire world. Uh, this is something that knows no borders, no race, uh, no religion, um, despite maybe uh, some myopic per per perceptions or perspectives on, on what terrorism is. Um, and in uh, Africa in particular, I think uh, we have seen a growth uh, in terrorist acts and the expansion of terrorist uh, groups over the last um, couple of decades in a way that we may not have um, imagined. And this has emerged to be one of uh, our greatest uh, threats to peace, security, stability, uh, and development um, across the continent. Um, and it's very complex. Uh, the complexity um, defies, I think, generalizations and, and, and one size fits all um, policy responses. And um, from the AU perspective, uh, we have uh, tried to evolve in terms of our uh, response uh, to these um, complexities. Um, with the increase in incidences in um, uh, violent extremism, in particular in specific regions uh, such as the Sahel, uh, the Lake Chad Basin, and more recently in, in, in Mozambique, you know, in the southern part of the, the continent that um, uh, was uh, for the most part, I think, sheltered um, from this situation. Um, there has clearly been a need for uh, enhanced cooperation uh, between uh, different, uh, different um, organizations and particularly um, uh, within the continent. And what we've done from the AU side, I think uh, since 1992 is that we've taken um, some steps to, to address it through the adoption of a number of resolutions and declarations um, in terms of strengthening cooperation, both with our member states, but also with our um, regional and economic communities, um, as well as the um, international, uh, international community. Um, we also uh, have a number of uh, institutions and uh, frameworks. Um, I know you have uh, a representative from one of our institutions, the Africa Center for Study and Research on um, Terrorism here. Um, we also have uh, the Community of Intelligence and Security Services, CISA, and also the AU Mechanism on uh, Police Cooperation, Afri AFRIPOL. Um, and of course, there's also the um, uh, Nouakchott and Djibouti processes for enhancing uh, security cooperation in the Sahel and East Africa regions in a number, uh, and a number of you know, peace support operations such as uh, AMISOM, MNJTF, um, JSANG Sahel, and so on and so forth. I know many of you know these, but I felt it was um, important for me to mention it in terms of context. 
Um, mm -hmm. And um, these are, I think, some of the uh, overall uh, challenges um, um, and some of the institutional frameworks that we have in place in order for us to address uh, a lot of the political, um, uh, financial, and um, uh, otherwise uh, threats uh, that um, that are posed by the by this uh, um, the scorch. Uh, the second issue um, is the issue of climate change, which I mentioned, and I would like mm -hmm. to link this uh, to the issue of food security and, of mm -hmm. course, poverty, which I think are very much uh, very much interlinked. And we've seen uh, over time the dire effects of climate change and how this has worsened. Uh, the socioeconomic um, and security dynamics in many parts of uh, Africa. And this has had dire consequences on uh, vulnerable communities, um, particularly women and children. Um, and today, millions of people require humanitarian support because of acute shortfalls in food uh, due to conflict in some regions, but also um, due to the issue of, of, of climate change. Uh, for example, I've seen um, the region where I come from, which is the northeast uh, of Nigeria um, and, and, and the Sahel, um, uh, in addition uh, to the um, current um, uh, uh, crisis, uh, we've seen how it has been exacerbated because of climate change with the shrinking of, um, of the Lake Chad and how mm -hmm. this has created uh, uh, um, what I would say um, a, a multi-dimensional threat um, uh, in terms of conflict and, and, and food and food insecurity. And this has also um, been exacerbated by other factors uh, such as um, uh, trade and economic uh, interests, for example, um, agricultural production, and uh, of course, uh, social issues uh, such as um, uh, healthcare um, and, and, and education. Um, and then the third point uh, I would say is um, the issue of um, pandemics, uh, which obviously uh, we've uh, uh, talked about uh, quite a bit. Um, and of course, this continues to be a challenge on the continent. But I think with the uh, COVID-19 situation, um, this has shown that we are all vulnerable, right? Um, and this has exposed all nations' fragilities. Um, and I think uh, to a certain extent, this crisis also um, somehow provides an opportunity um, for us to profoundly think about or rethink about some of the socioeconomic uh, policy frameworks in order for us to be able to, uh, to build um, back uh, better. The last point um, uh, I'd, I'd like to make and link it very closely to all the, the other three that I mentioned is the issue of um, uh, poverty, which I believe um, is a pandemic uh, of its own. Um, I think we're experiencing in different regions and countries the ongoing social, um, uh, uh, the ongoing economic and social fallouts of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And we also realize that the crisis is also reversing decades of um, the progress uh, that we've made in terms of fighting uh, poverty and it's also exacerbating um, some of the uh, high level of already existing inequalities um, uh, amongst uh, many um, uh, populations and, and, and within many, many, many countries. Um, but like I said, it has also, um, the pandemic has also exposed uh, that, you know, we are all um, uh, fragile and in, in terms of inequalities and the issue of, of poverty, I think this has also um, uh, exposed uh, um, vulnerabilities even within um, country contexts that we never uh, would have uh, imagined um, uh, previously. Um, and so uh, for me, like I said, this is definitely, it should be seen um, uh, as an opportunity um, uh, to be able to build back better. And maybe to conclude on this um, particular point, I think if you combine um, this ever-growing population that we have in the continent with the youth bulge, the issue of climate change, um, uh, terrorism, the economic challenges, it kind of creates this ecosystem, right, for nurturing uh, further insecurity. Um, mm -hmm. And particularly when it comes to young people, it'll become even uh, easier if, uh, 
we do not um, mitigate, uh, it will become even easier to recruit many of them into terrorist groups, uh, which are able to feed on their frustrations and genuine, genuine frustrations and provide, because they're able to provide some of the economic opportunities, uh, which otherwise would have been um, unattain unattainable for them. Well, thank you, Ambassador Mohammed. You've you put a lot on the table, and you've already you know, uh, described, I think, in several ways, you know, the kinds of uh, partnerships or forms of collective action, you know, if I can say it that way, that are necessary. Whether we're thinking about our more traditional hard security challenges, such as countering terrorists and violent extremism, uh, or we're thinking uh, more holistically about you know, the sort of structural uh, challenges that climate poses uh, you know, to food security, you know, to livelihoods uh, for, for citizens uh, uh, across you know, uh, some of the harshest uh, uh, climates, of course, uh, you know, but uh, increasingly we're seeing uh, food, food insecurity challenges uh, you know, in a variety of contexts and, and places as, as well as then you know, the, the mounting um, uh, uh, numbers of uh, people that are uh, uh, really living in uh, very poor circumstances, right? And uh, how COVID exacerbates that and uh, uh, sets us back uh, so far. And all of these things are, are sort of on the, the plate, uh, so to speak, for our security leaders uh, to, to be cognizant of and you know, to be thinking about um, as uh, uh, drivers of security challenges as uh, uh, key um, uh, uh, elements uh, affecting the landscape. And um, I, I would just be curious if you could um, share with us uh, uh, for another minute or two, you know, what, what you've observed makes for an effective, um, uh, an effective partnership, uh, be that, um, uh, 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 let's be clear, that's not just, uh, you know, from Africa to external partners to the continent, but partnership is within the continent as well, right? Uh, at uh, various levels, and you ticked off a number of uh, African-led uh, initiatives uh, to, to meet some of these challenges, whether we're thinking about MNJTF, G5 Sahel, and yes, fine, there's you know, some element of external assistance to those, yeah, but you know, the African you know, Union, the RECs, have, uh, have taken you know, their own initiatives, uh, and uh, without putting you too much on the spot, but where do you see, you know, where do you see there's um, greater effect uh, uh, from uh, that kind of collective action and uh, coming together to meet shared uh, challenges. Uh, 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 what uh, should our, our uh, leaders uh, 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 be thinking about uh, that uh, can uh, lead themselves you know, uh, to enable more effective partnerships within the continent and then, of course, uh, to external actors as well? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you once again, Kate. Um, let me start by saying, um, I, you know, I, I, I've heard the word assistance come in uh, uh, several times, but I appreciate the use of the word um, partnerships because I think um, this is uh, not only key uh, for um, confronting uh, shared threats, um, such as all the ones that you've mentioned, terrorism, violent extremism, transnational organized crime, um, and of course, um, the pandemics. But I think it's also necessary for building um, uh, cooperation. And I think that there are unlimited opportunities um, in, in, in cooperation, um, not only um, between countries bilaterally, but also um, as regions and, 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 and institutions. And we can always uh, build on each other's uh, strengths um, and expertise uh, when it comes uh, particularly to regional knowledge and um, uh, specialized expertise, uh, but also uh, leverage, I think, on some of the existing partnerships and networks um, that, that, that already um, exist and, 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 and learn lessons um, from, uh, uh, from, from, from each other. So um, relationships are not necessarily about the donor and the donee or um, the giver and the uh, uh, receiver. Um, uh, you know, uh, in, in some cases, uh, I think uh, material support um, is necessary in order to support um, some of the um, uh, existing, I think, accomplishments uh, that you have in specific either countries, uh, subregions or, 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 or regions, depending on, on 
the context, um, you know, if, if a country is making uh, uh, national efforts towards fighting uh, terrorism and combating violent extremism, but they don't necessarily um, have the technologies of the tools that 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 are that are required uh, to be able uh, uh, to 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 defend themselves and protect their populations, uh, while terrorists have more sophisticated um, material than they do. Uh, then you know definitely there would be a need uh, to ensure um, that we have you know the kind of um, bilateral and multilateral um, uh, uh, partners that can uh, that can um, uh, support them. Um, that said, I think I, I I will focus maybe my intervention a little bit um, uh, more on uh, the partnership that we 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 have uh, with the UN. Uh, particularly within um, the context of the more recent collaboration we have between the two organizations and probably uh, build on that in terms of, you know, our cooperation with our um, sub-regional and um, um, some of the um, uh, national, I think, uh, partnerships. Um, so in terms of just um, information, in, in, in 2017, uh, the African Union and the UN signed uh, what we call a, a joint framework for enhanced partnership in peace and security, and then subsequently um, a framework on, on, on development with a focus on Agenda 2030 and Agenda 2063, which are, which are our development uh, agendas. And the objective of this was you know, the institutionalization of our joint efforts, um, the joint efforts of the two um, organization, organizations. And um, the, the, the two mechanisms, um, or, or legal frameworks, if you have, uh, if you, if, 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 if I may, is kind of like a, um, a, a platform that has helped us to enhance our collaboration and coherence um, to the extent that today, you know, consultation and coordination between the institutions, um, AU and the UN, but also the AU and our regional economic communities and our regional mechanisms um, have become more of a, um, um, a, a norm rather than, than an exception. And we've been able to harmonize some of the um, strategies and approaches um, uh, that we currently um, have, have in place. Um, so I, I can say from my experience that I've seen a significant amount of progress in terms of how we coordinate and collaborate better. And this has kind of helped us to move from um, uh, ad hoc kind of systems and approaches to more kind of structural structured and to a certain extent predictable um of course you know when it comes to <laughs> security or insecurity nothing nothing is uh, is predictable um but at least when it comes to your approaches particularly when it comes to consultation consultations and how to move forward um you um have more of a structured um approach mm -hmm. and these um relevant frameworks have also helped us to effectively address some of the very complex peace and security challenges that we have on the on the continent. Um, of course, you know these are based on uh, you know the principles of subsidiarity and complementarity and comparative advantages, and um, uh, it has allowed us uh, to kind of focus more in a more structured manner uh, in terms of uh, achieving some of the milestones. Uh, we've set um, uh, for for ourselves, um, particularly in terms of development, but also you know, um, silencing the guns and 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 um, being able to focus uh, more on um, developing uh, the continent. So we've tried to prioritize um, uh, deepening uh, this 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 cooperation and also deepening our cooperation with our regional economic communities and regional mechanisms. Um, in terms of regional peace and security issues, um, because they do have a comparative advantage, and we recognize that as as the AU, and which we feel, you know, uh, like I said, it is important for the global community to also recognize um, that the national, uh, regional, and continental levels are very important in order uh, for us to be able to um, um, address some of the fundamental um, uh, issues of peace and security, and also um, the root causes. Um, 
when it comes to, uh, I think, some of the context specific issues, uh, also, uh, I think the role of uh, regional and sub regional organizations is also fundamental because they're better placed um, in terms of understanding, uh, particularly the local context. And they have the capacity to better articulate um, some of the international obligations with the, which they've um, signed up for. Um, and um, ensure that there's there's follow up uh, in terms of you know local actions uh, and programs while we continue to ensure that there is um, complementarity within existing uh, mechanisms um, and uh, and and initiatives. So all in all, partnerships are important, um, and we have to be able to um, uh, ensure we we uh, we continue um, to consolidate some of the hard won gains. Um, through uh, enhancing some of this uh, coordination and collaboration between our various institutions. Well, you've um, also touched on a number of the qualities of uh, uh, adaptive leadership, I think, uh, in uh, giving us uh, uh, your insights uh, on uh, what makes uh, partnerships uh, more effective and uh, um, uh, fit for purpose, if I can say it that way, uh, right, in terms of uh, having structures, uh, frameworks in place uh, that uh, you know, give the forum, you know, give the setting for you know, identifying priorities together for organizing uh, uh, actions and initiatives uh, you know, to be um, uh, both responsive uh, to, to things that are emerging you know, and hopefully to, to anticipate together, right? And, and uh, you know, to identify where the comparative advantages of uh, different uh, levels of responses, different kinds of uh, collective action uh, could come from. 